Bienvenidos, eh, bienvenidos a todos a este ciclo abierto de charlas eh, que lleva por nombre Materias Mediales, Media Matters, uh, un espacio de conversación desde el arte y las tecnociencias contemporáneas frente a una planetaridad en transformación. Um, agradecemos al CCD por acoger este ciclo y a Dorín Ríos por la vinculación y el apoyo y al equipo del CCD por todo el trabajo que están haciendo uh, y también Agradecemos mucho a Pierce Myers por aceptar nuestra invitación. Um, bueno, Materias Mediales, uh, Media Matters, se desprende del programa formativo homónimo hospedado por Centro ADM en colaboración con la Agencia de Investigación Artística Media Forensis. Uh, en este programa formativo que, que está todavía en curso, Uh, eh, exploramos posibles modos de investigación transversales a las artes y a las tecnociencias contemporáneas y bueno en concreto eh, desarrollamos investigaciones artísticas que retoman preguntas de la ciencia y se involucran con el desarrollo del pensamiento tecnológico uh, de este modo invitamos a repensar la práctica investigativa como una forma no solo de conocer mundo de otras maneras sino también eh, de hacer mundo y de habitarlo de maneras distintas. Tanto el programa formativo en curso como el ciclo abierto que estamos llevando a cabo con, en colaboración con el CCD se encuadra dentro del ámbito de emergencias introducidas por el impacto de la agencia humana sobre la geobiología terrestre, el cual nos surge a replantear nuestra condición misma al interior de este planeta. El reconocimiento de este proceso, conocido controversialmente como antropoceno, así como su desarrollo y su posible reconducción, es casi impensable sin la implicación histórica de las metodologías de la ciencia y las mediaciones de la tecnología. Es por ello que este ciclo nos invita a pensar los modos en que las técnicas y tecnologías de reconocimiento coemergen y se co-constituyen con aquellas que reconfiguran materialmente al mundo. Bueno, ante la proliferación de iniciativas para imaginar futuros posibles, hoy Pierce hará énfasis en la base investigativa que distingue la construcción de mundos de las ficciones en general y una consecuente selección y estandarización de técnicas y tecnologías. Pierce Myers es un escritor establecido en California. Se formó en antropología y arquitectura y lleva cinco años trabajando en el campo de la construcción de mundos. Su trabajo se enfoca en la investigación sobre diseño climático y visión estratégica en instituciones como Strelka Institute, eh, Experimental Design y SciArc. Y su, su ponencia de hoy pues, será en inglés, um, porque bueno, es su lengua materna y habla un poco de español, entonces eh, quizás, eh, quizás se va eh, a animar a, a contestar un par de preguntas en español. Um, pero bueno, hay espacio para que se mantenga eh, en, eh, en, en, en inglés, eh, pues también procurando que, 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 su, que todo su discurso y sus respuestas sean como lo más, este, tengan como el mejor cuerpo posible. Uh, entonces, pues bueno, comenzamos con, con, con esta plática. Pierce, uh, pues toda tuya. Muchas gracias por estar Bienvenido. acá. Sí, bienvenido. Y gracias a, a, a todas las personas que, que, que se conectan y que asisten a estas charlas. Eh, muchas gracias por estar acá. Bueno, pues gracias por invitarme uh, a la charla hoy. Creo que mi, mi español no es, no es bastante para, para comunicar sobre los temas de hoy. Pero bueno, gracias. Um, Yeah, so um, I'll share my screen here in a second. We can get started. Okay, so, so um, as Arjan mentioned, um, my work for the last five years or so has been in, in world building, Construcción de Mundos. Um, and so I'm going to talk a little bit about Uh, two different things, one of which is world building as a, as a process, both in general, I'll start with some general uh, design frameworks of world building, uh, talk about one specific project, 
and then transition into uh, a discussion of standards, standardization, code, and policy to kind of situate the, the, the practice of world building within the effects that it can have on, on the world itself. Um, so it's kind of a world building is sort of both a, a kind of outcome, a design outcome that you can that you can deliver for different clients uh, in a in a in the private sector that you can do with different cultural groups of any kind as an artistic practice. So I'll talk to, through some of those things, um, and then yeah, the back half will be about uh, some specific outcomes. And so one last thing in in framing it up is that there's one specific example that I'll be talking through, which is uh, the design of a, a floating city. Um, one of the themes that obviously of this of this course that you all are doing is has to do with the Anthropocene, uh, climate emergency risk, and things like that. So there's one specific project that I'll be talking through, which is which is a floating city, uh, which was um, for me was most of 2019 was working on one specific project. Um, but I'll get into that in, in just a minute. So there's like legacy formats for world building that everyone is really familiar with, whether you, you know it or not, or whether you use the term world building. Science fiction, uh, writers that you know, um, Neil Stevenson, Octavia Butler, film, Tarkovsky, you can think of your favorite filmmakers that create these, these fictive worlds that have different rules, uh, different kinds of logics to them, different, different cultures, things like that. Um, for the architects, you'll be familiar with some, maybe, you know, some of you are familiar with Buckminster Fuller or Super Studio, some of these architects in the, especially in the, the 60s um, was kind of, you know, Fuller was earlier, but in the 60s, there was a, a, a kind of strong movement to, to expand uh, what architects think is it's possible to do or what, what it's possible to think about and how it is that, that a, a walking city for instance, can be uh, a kind of metaphor for talking about contemporary cultural conditions of some kind, or, and this is kind of one of the things with, with world building, is that it can be specifically targeted towards, towards uh, some kind of some kind of design, where everyone is is trying to think about the you know, what you know, the design of a, the future of their institution, or it can be something that's used as a metaphor. And I think uh, some of Neil Blomkamp's movies, for instance, are, are really nice examples of, of how you use, uh, kind of create a metaphor, you know, with District 9, for instance, how that, that's a movie that's actually kind of a, a metaphor for apartheid. Um, so these are kind of ways that you can think about, different ways you can think about world building. And then there's scenario planning, which is a, a process that, that uh, is often undertaken by governments or military agencies, um, research and development RAND, things like that. So these are these are also kinds of world building processes as well. And they obviously span the range from aspirational uh, collective to dystopic, uh, militaristic. There's, a, there's, a, there's actually kind of a, a pretty broad range. Some of the newer uh, can sort of kind of contemporary Types of world building include things like game design, procedural generation, product design, uh, art, uh, things in machine learning and coded agent behaviors, um, as well as, as even in neuroscience itself. Uh, I'm not sure you know, exactly where everyone falls on the, on the spectrum of, of onlineness, how, how online you are, but maybe some of you. Uh, play, you know, do Minecraft, for instance, where, you know, this is another way of thinking about world building as a collective process, as a collaborative process. Um, world building with Dunn and Raby with product design is a kind of, is a, a design practice where they create artifacts from a world that doesn't exist. Uh, and, and this is kind of, this is kind of their method and you can look into this stuff. I don't really want to go too deeply into it. Um, or with Ian Ching, where you have a kind of mythological world with agents, uh, these sort of characters that operate uh, kind of autonomously based on how they've been constructed and, and out of simple rules uh, amongst you know, tens or hundreds of different agents, very complex uh, kind of behaviors emerge from that. 
And then like kind of the cutting edge, I guess you could say now is sort of all the attention around uh, DAOs, um, guilds and different kinds of literal spaces where people uh, embrace fictions in, in some way uh, as a way of kind of hyperstitionalizing themselves into, into existence. Um, so DAOs are a really interesting way of thinking about uh, refactoring the world. And so, you know, I like to think a little bit about fiction as, as a function, um, you know, almost in mathematical set terms of just drawing out a set space of possibilities. Um, you know, we, we know that things are possible, but for political reasons or certain economic reasons, they aren't. We know that they're possible. Um, and so world building is a kind of way of doing it a little bit more systematically from, from research and as a way of catalyzing energy around some sort of project. Um, you know, as a, as a kind of media, as a kind of media tactic that involves, that involves uh, groups of people. Um, I think I'll go through this part fairly quickly, uh, just about the process. Um, so there's, there's a, a research phase to every world build uh, where, you know, you've, you've decided on some kind of, uh, some kind of domain that you're interested in. In this case, let's say you have, okay, what does a city look like? What, what does Manhattan, Miami, uh, Dhaka, Lagos, what does that look like in 2070, for instance? Uh, knowing what we know about sea level rise, technology, economy, uh, making projections, what does that look like? And then you undergo a really long process of, of researching uh, a variety of different things. Um, I'll zip forward to this framework here. This is the kind of a world building framework that you can use. Uh, these are six buckets. Uh, that is as close as I've ever gotten and the people I work with have ever gotten to, to kind of creating a, a reduced set of, of buckets that compose every world. What is every world composed of? Um, infrastructure, governance, culture, energy, ecology, economy. You can refactor this too, but, but this is kind of a, a way of thinking about it. And then um, in terms of clients, you know, a client, and you could think about a client if you're doing this for, for work, but you could also think about this as any kind of group that has a, a purpose, some kind of purpose in mind, something that they're, that they're a, a space that they're trying to project into. Um, and so this, you know, if I talk about the, the ASCE is the one project that I'm talking about today, uh, which is basically a, a public private, they, they're a, a professional body in America that that basically sets all of the standards for civil engineering as a field. It's called the American Society of Civil Engineers, and what they essentially do is try to uh, create partnerships between the public, uh, the, the 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 sphere of, of policy, of um, subsidies, government regulations, and, and the private sector, uh, and they were interested in in understanding, okay, what do civil engineers need to be thinking about in the context of, of climate change? And so in this research phase, this is a big part of what you're doing is really well defining the problem, the problem space that you're looking at and, uh, and using these buckets to generate uh, a lot of research. Um, so what that looks like in a little bit more detail is interviewing subject matter experts, which are people that know a lot about something in particular. So I have an, an example here of, of, a, of a guy, a man named Simon Laflemme, who uh, is someone who's created a skin. It's basically a skin or a tape that you can apply onto different structures that produces signals that determine, it's a sensing skin. So these signals can determine if, uh, if some a bridge, for instance, is beginning to to sink or or move or kind of create and have sort of slight uh, shifts in its structure, and then it can report back. So this would be an example of a subject matter expert that you would interview. Um, you could also uh, interview, discuss things with with people that work for the group that you're working for. 
who obviously will know a lot about that domain. You can read papers and articles online and you kind of build a, a knowledge database uh, around the, the, the topic that you're, that you're interested in. So this would be an example of how that, how that works. And you can see here that different points you can, you can store within uh, this world building framework, thinking about you know, of, of infrastructure. And some of this I think will become a little bit more clear when I show some of the videos of how this works. Um, I'll kind of skip through some of this um, to get to this here. So there is, when you do this sort of research and you have different, different kind of ideas that, and, you, and you store them, you know, using, we were using something called Kumu, which is a, uh, it's kind of a, a mind mapping tool that you, that's, you know, you can use, it's online. Uh, you have several different ideas that, that can converge into something that for a floating city uh, starts to be novel or interesting. So this is where we were doing, we had research that was about um, kelp farms. We had a bunch of research about uh, kelp, both as a, a food source and also as a potential energy source. Um, and we were looking at research from a project called Terra Zero, uh, which is a project that basically is, is creating the, the technical infrastructure for a forest to own itself and make decisions on its own behalf. And then you create this sort of speculative provocation of a, a, a landscape feature or a kind of a, a, a microbiome, like a kelp forest that could own itself. And it would have, you would have autonomous drones uh, that, are, that are swimming around underwater, that are understanding uh, where certain kelp is, needs to be harvested, uh, they can understand the pH of the ocean and say that okay, this area is uh, not optimal. We should move the we should move the kelp over here, or it's not getting enough sunlight. Kind of like an autonomous landscape in a way. That's a kind of high, a cybernetic landscape. It's like a hybrid of of uh, biological and and technological systems. So that's just kind of an example of of a component. Um, the interesting thing about doing this sort of work in a workshop context with a client is that, as I think I said just a minute ago, it's both world building can be both an outcome uh, as well as a process. And it gets, it gets pe whoever's involved, it gets them really kind of excited and thinking about, about what, about what they're, they're working on. There's a lot of writing involved, uh, you know, scenarios, vignettes, presentations and decks. And that's kind of the final part of the, the research phase um, is writing. Um, so in the, in the design phase, when you actually build a world of some kind, you know, this, can, this can, again, you know, this can be just in, in writing, this can be a game, this could be concept art, um, this could be a film. You, know, you, you, can, you can turn a world into, into any number of things. Uh, for the project that I was working on, the Floating City in 2019, uh, we, we basically built a, a game engine using Unity. We built a whole series of, of time sequenced levels of how a floating city would evolve from 2020 to 2070. And so that process, once you've done this research and you've started to determine Okay, how is the city laid out? How is it organized? Uh, you then start with concept art and you start to do test renders. Um, you start to use architectural diagrams, uh, really simple schematics that you can iterate on quickly. And then you move into uh, the game engine design in Unity where people start to, the developers start to, to build it out, lay things out and start to build some of the, the interface tools in Unity so that eventually the client or, or anyone that, that's gonna come into that world and witness that world uh, can, can navigate nicely and, and understand it. There's also a web development component of the project. 
uh, and we created some video material. Um, and then, yeah, you kind of start to get it going. So this is, these are the three major, so identifying the problem, like why do you need to do a world build in the first place? For this particular client, there were three main issues that they were, the, the kind of pain points uh, that they had identified as the reason for needing to do something imaginative and different. Um, you know, industry coordination, like I mentioned, when you have a, when you're in a, an economy like America's that is relatively, relatively decentralized, uh, and there's no, there's no central, there's no central government entity that is determining, uh, you know, how, how it is that a new, a new class of infrastructure gets integrated into society. I mean, you have obviously, you know, roads are, are generally provided, you know, roads and bridges and things like that are provided, but in, in the context of climate change, there's, there's uh, a whole class of new infrastructure for these flood, these inundated, flooded, or, or, or kind of like uh, riparian zones where cities are located that, that doesn't exist and you can't really coordinate the industry. There's no one that can force, uh, you can't really force anyone to, any major companies to start building things unless you, you know, make issue really, really, really large contracts. Um, and the public bureaucracy is slow. Uh, and so that's kind of those first two things. And the, the last bit is that civil engineering as a field, I'm not sure if this is the, the case in, in um, Mexico or in different parts of the world, but a lot of young people that are, let's say ages 16 to 20, when they're starting to figure out how, what they wanna study or where they wanna go, civil engineering, a lot of people that might be interested in infrastructure in, in, in building worlds, uh, going into engineering are kind of getting siphoned off into the tech sector. Um, and so they, they wanna, this, they were really interested in figuring out how we could uh, use a game engine uh, to create a world that young people, that's a bit like Minecraft, but, but actually has infrastructure physics uh, that would be kind of exciting and enticing for, for young people. And so these are the, this is the sort of, uh, these are, this is what we kind of come back with. Okay, we're gonna, we're gonna build a software tool and a game engine make it a Minecraft for infrastructure. It will have uh, some simulation capacity uh, and it will be long-term. It'll be kind of far into the future and it can be a social space that young engineers use to talk about a, uh, a kind of uh, set of possibilities. So I have a couple videos that I'll show uh, of, how this, of how this looked and then we can, we can move on. Um, First, this one image, this just, this is a kind of almost collage of, of uh, a few different ideas from the, the far out kind of 20, you know, 2050 to 2070 range um, for the floating city where in the bottom left, you can see pieces of research, triangular platforms, uh, the kelp forest that I mentioned, and then you can see some of the some of the provocations or some of the the assets that we built in in 3D uh, that you'll see in this video. And these, some of these are, uh, yeah. So you'll see you'll see kind of some video.
and as a quick note, if you're if you're seeing things and you're skeptical, uh, that's part of the point, I think. Um, one of the things that this does, and I, I'll just skip through to the next, or I'll play this and I'll I'll, um, I'll mute it because the sound is not it's not amazing. I wouldn't say. Um, can you still still hear me? Cool. Yeah. One of the things that this does is it when you put this in front of engineers and policymakers, uh, engineer. If I can be a little bit more technical, if you, electrical engineers, uh, bridge designers, um, architects, transportation engineers, IT, cybersecurity people, um, a whole host of engineers, and then. Uh, people that work in, in policy, people that work in insurance, people that uh, run, let's say investment firms or whatever it is, when everyone sees this, you start to identify problems. And this is actually a big part of the point of, of doing this kind of work is that it isn't, it isn't just that it creates a vision that is inspiring to people or something like that. It, you know, people like it and it's interesting, but they start to say, well, this wouldn't look like that. Or if you wanted to achieve, uh, if you wanted to achieve uh, what you're talking about here, you would need, you know, this, this, and this. And unfortunately we can't do that. So this is kind of a, uh, this gives you a sense of the context in which this project was actually surfaced. Um, which is at a big conference that has a bunch of a bunch of engineers, and so you can start to see how it is that uh, what it what it does to people socially, what world building does when people get to to see this. Um, and what what doing it what this kind of thing does is that it, it this kind of transitions into the next part of the the conversation, which is about standardization. Um, I will, I think you kind of get the picture. There's a workshopping process involved um, where people are kind of constantly iterating on this thing. So I'll skip through to this next phase because uh, I think that that communicates it enough. So um, there's two examples of, there's two specific examples that, that I want to talk through with this of, of, of what this process did in terms of coming into from a space of abstraction, an abstract world or, or you know, possibilities into, into things that are a little bit more grounded. I, I pulled a picture here of an alchemist um, because there's a, there's a certain similarity with, uh, with, with alchemy in a way of how it is that you go from something that's, that's super, in some cases, super abstract into something uh, concrete that has a, a real world impact. Um, so you can think of code uh, as semantic infrastructure in a way, and what I mean by code is all of the all of the rules, you know, all of these rules, some of which are urgently needed and some of which might not be so great. So building code, infrastructure standards. If you've ever looked at uh, ISO, you, it's kind of one of these. Uh, how would I say it? It's one of these kind of like hidden things that most people never think about that that's once you see it, it's kind of everywhere. Uh, everything from chemistry to the width of train tracks. Um, you know, every it's just it's kind of like rules and, and standards that apply to almost all different types of, of manufactured matter. Um, the clearest example, I think, is this is the width, the width of different train tracks. Um, there was a time where as trains were being developed across, you know, from, I guess, the mid, mid 1800s uh, into, into the 20th century, all different parts of the world, different standards, different tracks. And so what you wind up with is trains carrying other trains because they're going to have to transfer onto another set of widths, or you have these systems on the right where uh, the trains are coming from, from, Kazakhstan into, into China from Russia, and they have to change three to four times because all the widths are different, it's a different system. Eventually you get a standardization system. Um, and so you can think of, 
you know, you can think of natural language uh, the way we think of trains, kind of in an abstract sense, like uh, what is the function of these, these bodies of, of written language that set all of the rules that actually determine how infrastructure gets built? And so I'll give two, two examples of this. Um, let's get to this part. Um, so obviously we know that this is, this is the, the tragedy that took place in Miami this past year, uh, where there was a situation in of basically a problematic foundation and some corners were cut in the, in the construction process and it resulted in a major collapse. Ultimately it has to do with the relationship between the foundation, the footing, you know, the, the territory and the, the, uh, the compliance of, of infrastructure uh, and how that, you know, that process of looking over that, like, obviously this is, there are reasons, we think of a lot of rules as being oppressive. There are rules that are obviously many of the rules that we don't think about very often are to prevent things like this. And then you have Manhattan, this is a projection for, for flooding. Uh, it's going to cause, you know, some really major shifts in different, in a lot of different parts of the world. 90% of the world's, you know, basically, you know, I think that half the world's population are in cities and 90% of urban populations are within 15 kilometers of the, of, of the coast. It's like a really, a really astounding number of our population uh, in the world lives. I don't know the exact number, but it's a lot. Um, there are a lot of precedents too for, for uh, floating commerce, floating cities, gardens, uh, things like this. But in America, and this is kind of one of the major problems that we identified, uh, anything that floats has to be classified technically as a vessel and vessels have to be built of steel. They have to have like a steel hull in most, in most jurisdictions. Um, but steel isn't the best way to build floating architecture because it's actually quite heavy. And so you get this kind of solution where someone is trying to follow the rules and they wind up with pontoons under a, a piece of floating architecture um, and it isn't actually optimal and it, you know, we've known for 10 years, the Dutch have known this for a really long time, other parts of the world also, uh, that it's actually steel, steel reinforcement inside a, a mixture of foam and synthetics and, and concrete that, that provides the best kind of floating architecture, the best base for it. Uh, but in, in the States, you can't build that. And so this is one of the conversations that came out of, of people spending time in this, uh, in this world, as I said, you know, this guy literally came up to me and was like, well, you know, you can't build that in America. Like he, he, talking about uh, uh, one of these types of foundations, he said, you can't build that because if it's floating on water, it has to be made of steel, it has to have a steel hull. And then, you know, I was like, oh, that's really interesting. I didn't know that. And then went over to, you know, this other person They're like, yeah, that's true. And these are the people that make the rules basically for infrastructure standards. This is who the client was. And so it's kind of, this created a conversation that came up in a workshop. And so it's kind of an interesting thing. Um, the other example has to do with another uh, solution to this is there's this woman named Elizabeth English, who's really, really interesting, who's based in Louisiana, where, as you know, there's the perennial flood. There's a huge amount of perennial flooding people that essentially live in a kind of amphibious landscape. A lot of people live in an amphibious landscape. And um, she's created a project called the Buoyant Foundations Project that is trying to do uh, amphibious retrofitting for houses that undergo flooding frequently. Um, and the issue that she runs into in this project is that under the, the national, the NFIP, which is the National Flood Insurance Program, um, there is no rule that permits this new kind of uh, architecture that she's built, which, has, which essentially puts pylons in the ground and houses can float up and down um, if, 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 uh, if floods come in. And as you, you know, the, the, the only way at the moment that this is legally buildable is, is by putting houses up on stilts. You may have seen images of this and I wish I had one. Um, so you have a bunch of, in these areas, you have a bunch of houses that are up on stilts. And over time, they're subject to like major wind issues, the foundations sink and the houses are lopsided. This is a new solution, but because 
uh, NFIP uh, doesn't permit this yet because it would basically the premiums would it would drastically reduce the risk to most homes so the premiums would go down really far uh, and so there's kind of like this rumor that that basically the national flood insurance program wants to retain a bunch of its policyholders and doesn't want to open it to to private insurers and so you have a you have a bunch of people up on up on stilts uh, as opposed to having a, a better solution. Um, and she has a lot of really interesting uh, projects that she's worked on in different parts of the world uh, that have to do with amphibiation. Uh, a bit of the, the nomenclature. Um, so it kind of brings up this question that comes back out. Uh, these are isolated examples of, of like small examples of, of how people respond to ecological risk. Uh, it has to do with rules that are determined by governing bodies, but because those are often sluggish, you have people that are you know, coming up with, with solutions basically to respond to this. Um, and there's this kind of question of uh, you know, how much decentralization is good in terms of catalyzing innovation versus, versus centralized responses to ecological risk. Um, one of my kind of, I guess, favorite insights from this project was looking at the difference between flood insurance, how it's issued in America versus China. Um, it turns out that, and if anyone you know, knows more about this than I do, I only know a few small things from the research that uh, for flood prone areas in China, they're actually only 3%, uh, two to three percent of assets, you know, basically architecture that exists in flood prone areas in China have insurance. Uh, and it's something like 95% in America. And the, the difference is that if something happens in China and a bunch of uh, a community gets wiped out, the state comes in and it takes care of everyone. Basically, it you know, relocates people temporarily or permanently. Uh, and, you know, and they, they deal with all the damages. Um, they build new homes for everyone and they rebuild it somewhere. Uh, and that's one way of doing it. And then in, in America, you know, you have, you have uh, basically it's all an insurance policy that each, that each individual you know, landholder, property holder takes out. And that might be national or private insurance. Um, but it's a, it's a kind of totally different idea of how you respond to ecological risk. And I think the reason why insurance became one of the focuses of the research in this project was because you, you just literally can't, no one can take the risk of building something without being able to insure it. Um, and so when you have really sluggish bureaucracy that's setting the rules for, uh, you know, what, what do we consider to be safe infrastructure, uh, whether it's a buoyant foundation, whether it's, uh, you know, gener you know, where, you know, generators or energy sources inside, inside building, like there's so many different details, uh, then you have a really sluggish response to, to climate change. Um, so like just to kind of end with this one sort of provocation, uh, this BlackRock is the, uh, biggest asset management company or, 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 or firm in the world. Like they have 10, I think it's $10 trillion that they have. They're kind of like in, they're kind of like the, uh, you know, they're kind of like, if there were to be evil, if there were to be an evil megacorp that a lot of people don't really know about, it would be BlackRock. Um, BlackRock has made a lot of super ambitious uh, claims about their climate change, their kind of climate change program, getting towards uh, net zero in terms of carbon. And people obviously, most people I think are, are right to recognize that a lot of it's greenwashing, you know. Um, except that they released, they released a uh, report that outlined in very, with, with very specific numbers how how it would be because they own so much across so many different 
industries and you know different verticals uh, that it's that climate change is now an imminent threat to in a unique way to them because they're so large it's a it's a threat to them uh, in a way that it isn't to to other you know kind of smaller entities um, and they were responsible during covid you know so people so basically before covid people were really like uh, this is just you know a bunch of you're just lying you know it's like uh you're playing no one's gonna you're not gonna meet your plans uh it's all just greenwashing and then during covid uh a, a microcosm of, of this kind of climate program that they set out happened which was that they recognized that covid would cause so much damage to their all of their portfolio companies that they were responsible for accelerating the vaccination process by eliminating competition between uh, different entities that they controlled. So generally in, a, in, a, in the American like capitalist model of, of the development of a vaccine, you'd have companies that are looking to profit off of, off of, uh, off of producing uh, any kind of medicine, you know, and it's, it's a, obviously a really terrible way of doing things. BlackRock is so big, however, that they were able to eliminate that and force collaboration between uh, a much wider set of the science and medicine community and produce the vaccine in a kind of a record time. And I think that's a really interesting um, metaphor for better or for worse for what might, what might happen with, with climate response uh, at, the, at the centralized scale. Um, and so I, I, I was just, you know, BlackRock communism was this term that I, I came across that I thought was provocative, you know, because I think it, it points to a lot of uh, obviously, a, a, you know, a really dark history of of how of how major entities can control things, but also the speed at which things can can transpire in the context of climate change. Um, and so, to kind of finish with this. Uh, you know, world building as this way of thinking about the relationship between language and infrastructure. Um, this process of translating from, from visions or possibilities into, into standards and infrastructure, uh, kind of like a bridge. I think world building is a really powerful method because uh, it's a kind of way of, of, of bringing together the in a way, the, the appeal and the power of art techniques into the, the space of, of science and engineering and, and uh, infrastructure and technology. And so the things that you know, I'm kind of interested in with, with world building, and there aren't that many examples of, I think people that are working on this or thinking a lot about risk modeling, ecological computing, um, transparency uh, of information uh, and translating, you know, translating that into, into standards that are going to apply to so many different categories of infrastructure that support worlds in the context of climate change. Um, and so this is kind of a half, half joke, half serious, but you know, I think that actuaries, the people that, that are responsible for, for modeling risk and, and thinking about security and insurance, in a way they're kind of like oracles um, and people that do really boring work, you know, work that we think of as really boring, like climate, com like compliance, you know, having, forcing industry to follow rules, you know, these are actually maybe the contemporary, you know, alchemists of, of today. And the last example I wanna leave with is a, a project called Terra Zero. Um, I just wanna put that in, some of y'all might, know of this already, but it seems to be, it's the first kind of provocation from 2016, 2017 uh, of, of the future of, I think, of the way that computing, risk modeling, ecological uncertainty starts to combine uh, with landscape management, uh, stewardship, decolonization, uh, and things of this nature. So I just wanted to to put that as a final, as a final, uh, like a leaving point. Um.
yeah, so thanks for the, thanks for the time. Thanks, Pierce. Thank you very much for your presentation. So, hay como varias cosas sobre las que me gustaría preguntar. Uh, sí, no sé si así dará tiempo. Um, pero pues, um, bueno, um, sobre qué me urgiría más preguntar. Tal vez sobre... Um, Tal vez sobre dos o tres cosas, sobre la, sobre, um, como la figura del, del cliente, sobre, sobre, sobre la práctica de, de producir ficción o de hacer world building, bueno, construcción de mundo, uh, eh, y, y sobre, sobre el rol de, el rol de, del gobierno. Bueno, mm. y, y, y también sobre, 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 sobre tus, tus ideas como sobre usar, um, o oh, bueno, me, mediar, mediar una, una situación de, de simultánea, eh, de simultánea eh, distribución, como de, mm -hmm. de, de, de sensación, sensing, you know, mm -hmm. eh, yeah. Eh, yeah. Que, bueno, como yeah. podría tener la acepción como de vigilancia en el contexto, como en, en términos como de capitalismo de, de datos o capitalismo de vigilancia, eh, entre, entre, ajá, como esta, esta situación de, que es al mismo tiempo de distribución, eh, como de sensación y de, y de agencia, pero yeah. al mismo tiempo eh, una, situa una situación que puede tener un cierto nivel de centralización. Uh -huh. eh, que también parece ser necesario para lidiar con el, con yeah. el, con el riesgo, eh, con los riesgos climáticos, ¿no? Esto uh -huh. en tu ensayo de, que, se, que, yeah. que, que, que se llama Miami, eh, pues hablabas de esto, ¿no? Cómo, cómo a través de, de, de la tecnología de blockchain, esta simultánea distribución y centralización puede, uh -huh. puede ser posible, ¿no? Entonces, yeah. pues sí, no sé cómo que, eh, bueno, quizás si quieres... Te, no, ¿Quieres que, 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 que mm, expanda un poquito como, como estos puntos y tú em, em, empiezas por donde quieras? Yeah. Va, pues, um, bueno, además de, de la, de, de, del punto sobre, sobre, uh, sobre blockchain y, yeah. y gobernabilidad y todo esto, um, también, también a, a raíz de, de este ensayo... Um, tuyo, me preguntaba, me preguntaba, uh, tal vez un poco ociosamente, pero, o, o en un nivel como, como, pues muy, como, muy, como muy abstracto, como cuál, cuál, cuál sería el rol de, de, del gobierno o de un cuerpo gubernamental, eh, um, uh -huh. pues como en, o sea, como, como en, un, en un futuro viable, en un, fu en un futuro, yeah. en un futuro, pues, planetario, ¿no? O sea, como dentro de un realismo planetario en el que estas divisiones este, eh, que, que, que algunos llamarían este, westfalianas, o sea, como de nas, naciones-estado que se autodeterminan yeah. y todo esto. En, o sea, como en este futuro viable, ¿cuál sería el rol de, de un cuerpo gubernamental y me preguntaba si, si tal vez el rol fundamental de, 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 de esta entidad sería, um, sería una cierta preservación de la predictibilidad, like a preservation of predictability, uh, y unas, como un, un rol que tiene que ver tal vez con, um, con asegurar que, que haya constantes en el desarrollo de los hechos, ¿no? De modo que, pues, los... De modo que se pueda... Que se puedan pensar y se puedan abordar, eh, pues, los riesgos, así como también como las posibilidades de, de existencia, ¿no? Como de, 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 de existencia, de vivencia, de vida. O sea, um, porque 
pues en el contexto como de, del libre mercado y, de, y, del, y del riesgo climático, todo es cada vez más impredecible. ¿no? Entonces, ese, eh, bueno, es esa pequeña pregunta. Si tú crees que el rol fundamental del gobierno tal vez tiene que ver con, 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 con cuidar que, que, que haya, que haya predicti predictibilidad y haya constantes en nuestro como percepción y entendimiento como de, del mundo y del desarrollo de los hechos. Um, o, um, y bueno, más, como, más en el contexto de tu presentación, uh, quería preguntarte um, cómo, cómo, pues cómo, uh, pues qué, qué maneras crees tú que hay de... de de pensar en, en la figura que, 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 que demanda o que requiere, ¿no? que necesita um, cambios a nivel infraestructural. Um, porque tú hablaste del, del cliente, ¿no? de los clientes. Um, pero, pero ¿qué, qué otras, como, qué otras, qué otras, o, o qué figuras te parecerían a ti importantes? Eh, adem, o, o sea, si, preguntarte si es el cliente, si tú lo piensas como un cliente o si lo piensas como comunidades específicas o si lo piensas como eh, grupos identitarios o cómo piensas tú que, que deberíamos identificar a estos agentes de donde, desde donde la necesidad de cambio de, de transformaciones a nivel infraestructural bueno y ecológico eh, eh, sí, com, um, pues, o, o si, tal vez, si tal vez pues va más allá de, 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 de figuras individuales o colectivas humanas y tal vez es como todo el ecosistema el que tiene que estar demandando necesidades desde todos los puntos, ¿no? Eh, en fin, eh, y... Y también preguntarte si eh, tú piensas um, como en, al, en, al, en, en una diferencia importante eh, que, que se puede hacer entre futuros, entre futuros posibles y futuros probables. ¿no? Um, eh, porque, pues, bueno, como decíamos al inicio, hay como una proliferación de iniciativas, um, pues en, como en muchos sectores, ¿no? Pero, pero desde el arte, o sea, como en, en sectores como, como el sector como cultural, como, como del arte, del arte contemporáneo, hay muchos proyectos que tienen que ver con imaginar futuros posibles, ¿no? Imaginemos, imaginemos. Pero no queda muy claro en muchos casos cómo intentan imaginar esos futuros uh, y qué tanto uh, se intenta... Um, eh, que esas, esas imaginaciones, esos imaginarios puedan ser um, objetados por la propia realidad. ¿Se entiende esto? Objetados, like, like uh, contested mm. by, by reality itself. Um, entonces, sí, pues a mí me, me gustó esta distinción que tú hiciste entre ficciones, entre hacer ficción y hacer world building como como un proceso más, más sistematizado y basado en la investigación. Y bueno, pues la investigación nos interesa mucho, ¿no? Es como, 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 un, como la práctica central que nos interesa en, en materias mediales. Y bueno, pues más o menos como todo, todo eso, eh, me interesa yeah. saber qué piensas sobre todo eso. Yeah. Yeah. ¿Se, ¿Se entendió todo? Bueno, eh, hice un intento de traducir eh, algunas de las preguntas claves en el chat, entonces peers están ahí como traducidas por si te has perdido en algún punto eh, pues que puedas seguir un poco como algunos de los cuestionamientos clave que, que estaba articulando Arjan yeah. me falta el último, ahorita lo pongo yeah. Yeah, I mean I think like the what, you know, all that was making me think a lot about this, this way in which Um, governing bodies are, and when I say governing bodies, not just central governments, but, but regulatory bodies like 
There's one called GRI, a Global Reporting Initiative. Um, there are, you know, there's the the UN's SDGs. You know, they're the Sustainable Sustainable Development Goals. How it is that you have a governing body that can sculpt decentralized activity, uh, decentralized kind of in in the sense of a of a of a private sector um, that has in the case of America, the capacity to do things like metab figure out clever ways with chemistry to metabolize uh, the waste products that are produced by some industrial process. And it come, it's almost like uh, how you build a governing body, how it is that you either on the one hand enforce things or you, uh, you cultivate or incentivize things. So it's hard to imagine in America uh, in the next five to 10 years, having a government <clears throat> that stop, that just puts blanket limitations across energy manufacturing sector, energy sectors, manufacturing sectors, uh, places limits on, on major corporations at the corporate level. It's really hard to imagine that. What, what you kind of have now is this general program of, of uh, placing culpability in the American space onto individuals. You know, this is kind of part of the, the you could think about this in terms of, you know, capitalist realism, uh, like Mark Fisher kind of discourse, you know, where you have, the, where the individual is, is ultimately the one who is assumed to have responsibility for playing their part. So that's like on the, and those are kind of on like the, the, and of course those messages don't come from the US government, but they kind of come from like a general, they kind of come from a general ethos, you know, that oftentimes might be like, uh, you know, political pressure is coming upward from, from science being translated into people's sentiments. And that kind of comes upward. And then you have, you have uh, a kind of somewhere between corporate PR where they're like, look, we have, we have plastic and all of this, you know, we have, we have, uh, you know, paper straws and we don't use plastic um, to then having sort of like, I don't know, just messaging passes around in, in the American context that assumes that people are kind of like responsible. And it's hard to imagine a government that limits, limits uh, corporate behavior. On the other hand, it's really possible uh, on the other side to imagine the ways that the, if you take the way that America subsidizes corn production, it's like the numbers per second. It's like, it's like, I don't know. One of my friends did the statistic. It's like $10 million a second or something crazy like this that go into the subsidization of corn production in America, because in general, it's like, so it's just like not viable on, a, on free market terms. Or if you look at the, the subsidies the, the losses, you know, the military, you know, the US military is just like, doesn't, you know, it's just like there's huge, there's huge amounts of money. It's really possible to imagine uh, a central authority that can create incentives through subsidies or programs for private sector contractors that do things like, say, uh, there's all this plastic waste and this industrial company has figured out how to create an enzyme, like a living, a living uh, bacteria, like an enzyme bacteria that metabolizes plastic. Like, you know, this Japanese scientist discovered it in 2016. Now everyone knows it's possible. Well, you could think about uh, the American government or major corporations, potentially, like getting that technology and actually trying to put this to play at scale, you know, because it would be a really, you know, it would be a really good look for that company, um, but it would also have a variety of, of positive effects, you know, on, on adjacent ecosystems. So there's like, there's more and more pressure to do this kind of thing. In the American context, I guess it's a question of whether it comes from, you know, these sort of like, I think it's kind of simplistic to think about people making demands and everything responds. And it's also not obviously top down corporations don't operate from the goodness of their hearts. There's kind of these like institutions 
that are really powerful, but they're kind of quiet that are like policy think tanks um, and uh, you know, research institutions that get big money from companies, but then they kind of are the ones that are steering towards progressive, slightly progressive directions. Um, so that's how I think about that question. I mean, the, in general, at a more abstract level, you know, the question of what should be centralized and what shouldn't be centralized. Climate, like how amazing would it be if there was a centralized, where all of, all of different, you know, all this different scientific climate data, you know, everything from looking at soils, biodiversity, air quality, uh, you know, all these different domains, like if, if this stuff could exist in a centralized representation that was open and available uh, to, to anyone or to, or to partnering organizations. And if you have, with insurance and security, these companies are like with insurance companies, for instance, that are trying to model this climate risk, you know, they're all trying to compete with each other. And so they have, they have, you know, their computers are here and they're all kind of siloed, you know, um, but without a kind of like open representation of climate dynamics with, with projections and predictions, kind of like what you, you mentioned, uh, it's, I think it's kind of hard to create, um, it's hard to coordinate, uh, to create massive coordination across, um, you know, civil society, uh, industrial sectors, things like that. So, I mean, this is kind of like a, maybe an aspirational idea, but it is being assembled. Like if you look at this project Earth Cube, there's one called Earth Cube, which is just like, it's basically scientists communicating and aggregating information. Um, and then, you know, GRI is another kind of like reporting initiative. These, these are like the seeds of, of a kind of, uh, relatively open planetary, you know, geoscience computer in a way. No sé si, te, si tienes algo que comentar sobre, sobre, o oh, bueno, o si, o si está, está ya dicho en, en, en lo que acabas, en lo que acabas de, de, de contar sobre como, pues como el, los agentes que, que right. de donde estas demandas podrían eh, o tendrían que tendrían que provenir um, que tal vez sí tal vez pues tal vez de todo tipo de agentes no como uh, animales vegetales eh, maquinales uh, mm. y, y todos todos los agentes que compongan como pues el ecosistema o no sé como cuál uh, sí cómo cómo lo piensas cómo lo piensas tú I mean, I guess there's like the people, you know, there's sort of like the, some of these philosophical angles on, you know, material, material agency, um, you know, post-human, you know, forms of like post-human agency. I think there's probably people tuning in, you know, that are like sympathetic to thinking about the kind of, you know, whether it's something like, you know, the agency of, of a chemical, you know, of excess CO2 and the, in the environment or whether it's the agency of mycelia, you know, I think like in my head, you know, I think I've wanted to focus on human action at a specific level that is kind of like, that's basically at the, the kind of international, it's kind of like how the international kind of like intellectual, progressive intellectual community starts forming into these sorts of initiatives where you have a generation of people that are, you know, more or less our age that, that, that are coming up in the world into positions where, you know, they may be professors, they may have companies, you know, they may work, work in, let's say they work in academia, let's say they work in, in uh, you know, engineering, uh, they work in technology, architecture, urbanism. That they're that people start to, uh, I guess, have you know. It's kind of like this question of a of a, of global governance. You know, like the role of glo global governance is really problematic 
there are parts of it that are really necessary, I think, uh, when it comes to setting, you know, standards for, for companies. I don't know. It's a, it's a kind of problematic thing, I guess. It's like, I don't know exactly how I feel about it, you know. Um, let's say like the formation of a, of a body or it's kind of, I guess the question really is, how is a global governance different than beyond its jurisdiction, beyond the obvious reasons why it's different than a Westphalian nation state? You know, how does it look different at a, at a technical level in terms of what it looks at, you know, like what it sees, what it models, what, and then what it, what it discourages and encourages? Because I guess like a lot of the fear and phobia around global governance is that it's just going to be, you know, essentially a, a single Eurocentric or, or, you know, Euro, Euro Sino uh, you know, extension of Westphalian sovereignty and continues to subjugate people to, to, you know, endless consumption or, or unfulfilling work. Um, but maybe it winds up looking really, really different. You know, maybe, maybe it doesn't look like that at all. Maybe it's non-militaristic. Maybe it's something that, uh, you know, can incentivize can incentive work from incentivizing as opposed to work from oppressing, oppressing, I guess. It's kind of, yeah. I mean, when, you, when you're talking about agency, do you mean sort of like thinking in the post-human space as well? Yeah, yeah. And you sort of uh, um, suggested it in, in your essay. Yeah. Why not? The, 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 should should I, I ask it in, in English or, or, or my questions in Spanish are being like clear. Like, no, I'm, I think I understand them, yeah. Okay, okay. Bueno, yeah. sí, en, eh, en tu ensayo, um, sí, creo que, creo que sugerías un, un poco um, uh, una situación en la que, en la que hay pues una, un, un, una interconexión info, informática o informacional entre pues um, que, que incluye pues uh, humanos y no humanos ¿no? Como, uh, y ecosistemas yeah. y hablabas como de un, de un sistema automatizado en el que en el que las necesidades como de, de construcción de infraestructura o de suministro de recursos um, se, se, se activan automáticamente yeah, right, cuando, right. cuando esta necesidad de recursos o de intervención es, es detectada y no necesariamente quien la detecta mm -hmm. son personas, ¿no? Yeah, yeah, yeah. This is really, like, this is one of these uh, really, it's like a really, like a two-sided coin or like a double-edged sword. Like, I think there's this whole idea of autonomous, you know, I mentioned this autonomous landscapes idea or like, or like, you know, uh, fully you know okay so it starts with this ha half earth idea eo wilson he's this right naturalist and writer who said who created this this proposal which is that we should set aside half of the earth for rewilding you know and so there's a certain affinity with with uh with the kind of rewilding idea in this um and so you can start to think about uh in a kind of speculative way um what would it look like for an ecosystem that would might, you know, like a, a, a massive national park or some large ecosystem to have its own uh, defense system, right? If we think about humans, if, if we just think about humans as a virus, you know, I'm not, I don't believe that necessarily. I don't think that that's true. But if you think about humans as a virus or humans that want natural, natural resources, you can think about this sci-fi idea of a, of a, an ecosystem that protects and weaponizes itself against incursion and resource extraction, you know? And what that would look like at a technical level would involve basically a lot of these nascent technologies that are popping up right now. Um, remote, you know, remote sensing, uh, you know, satellites that, satellites or drones, you know, at a, at a variety of levels that produce a, a model of that of that environment you know and this is essentially what consciousness you know or, or cognition maybe is a better word is essentially like basically the ability to understand your and perceive your the self you know it's kind of this this meta loop and that has to do with the production of models you know we, we 
as, as minds, you know, we produce, we produce models of our worlds and we produce models of ourselves, you know, and this is kind of like a basic element of, of, uh, of how we think about what intelligence is, uh, at least, at least human intelligence. Um, if you had, yeah, you could, you could think of a landscape that, that could do a similar thing, let's say, and with sufficient advancement in artificial general intelligence, where, uh, the sensing that, the sensing that feeds a conscious mind, you know, instead of eyes and, you know, noses and tongues and skin, you know, it's a, it's a kind of a cybernetic sort of sensing that is producing a, a model. I'm not suggesting a landscape with computers in it would be conscious necessarily, but it can certainly be designed and programmed to, to act in certain ways. Um, to trigger relationships between itself and the outside world, whether that's in a process of trade, uh, in a process of total exclusion and rewilding, you know, whether it has permeable boundaries or whatever. Um, this to me is a really like interesting kind of sci-fi jurisdiction idea that um, is, you know, it's really interesting to think about how it would happen and how it would be stewarded, you know, from the existing paradigm is, is interesting too. Um, you know, then you, you get into questions of, of like, you know, carbon coin, some of these ideas around ecological economics, like, will we eventually have a currency that's tethered directly to, to, you know, carbon, for instance, you know, what backs a currency? And another thing that's kind of interesting right now with blockchain is thinking about how closely, how it's how energy, you know, literal literal energy consumption and currency are starting to converge a little bit. You know, with people thinking about, uh, you know, it used to be, you know, the whole history of currency is kind of interesting and in how it's converging with pure energy. Um, you know, just running blockchain nodes, like can it can can it can a currency be, uh, you know backed by carbon or can, can it have a little bit of math behind it that's a few different variables like carbon or something that, that determine its value. Yeah, yeah. Well, thanks, thanks. Uh, bueno, maybe... voy a hacer una pregunta. Te la puse en el chat también en, en inglés que tiene que ver con, primero con cuestiones de quizás de, de ética y de responsabilidad que no hemos abordado hoy aquí y que quizás no, ya no este, tenemos tiempo y, y en, en relación sobre todo con la plática que tuvimos eh, en, eh, con Helen Torres y Nadia Cortés en nuestra primera sesión de materias mediales ciclo abierto entonces ellas eh, planteaban al final un poco que eh, las posturas que se proponen y las respuestas que se proponen desde esta noción este, occidental del antropoceno tienen que ver con, pues, con unas ciertas eh, pues, posiciones occidentales mmm, que no se corresponde con lo que sucede y se experiencia en, en otros lugares. Uh -huh. eh, ¿no? quizás más periféricos o, o bueno, no, no, no tan eh, influenciados por el pensamiento occidental. Entonces ellas planteaban que, que de hecho hay comunidades y hay este, territorios que están respondiendo a las urgencias que plantea el cambio climático desde lugares muy particulares, ¿no? que sí eh, tienen que ver con con también formas de conocimiento y tecnologías este, situadas en, en estos territorios, pero no necesariamente con, con un solucionismo tecnológico ¿no? y como con esta eh, lógica de control que se plantea como desde Occidente y, y desde este marco de entendimiento del, del antropoceno. ¿no? Entonces, bueno, después de esta introducción, mi pregunta eh, te, tiene que ver, querría como retomar por un lado el pensamiento eh, de Anna Singh y Donna Haraway y cómo ellas proponen ir más allá del solucionismo tecnológico y de su lógica de control. Y, um, y ellas plantean esto de staying with the trouble, 
como una forma de regar la vida entre las ruinas o mantener y procurar eh, florecimientos multiespecie como en territorios y lugares como muy específicos que están heridos, dañados, pero todavía vivos. ¿no? Entonces me pregunto un poco si estás familiarizado con el pensamiento de estas autoras y cuál sería tu postura al respecto, y sobre todo en, en, en esta cuestión del solucionismo tecnológico y, y su lógica de control. Y, y bueno, esto también me llevaría a preguntarte por eh, la, la cuestión como de responsabilidad y ética, que es cierto que es, las urgencias que nos plantea el cambio climático nos, nos eh, obligan a, a responder a las problemáticas y las transformaciones este, inminentes que, que, que nos atraviesan o que están tomando lugar. Pero también me pregunto cómo podemos no solo responder a, sino responder por. Es decir, cómo encontrar formas de hacernos responsables, o sea, de dar cuenta de lo que está pasando, ¿no? más allá de, de una respuesta que, que busque solucionar. Uh -huh. Yeah, I think that the question of control is really, really closely tied up, I think, with a lot of the desire that people feel in inside, if you want to like a West, you know, Western logic, you know, like a, I think it was David Graeber, I don't, I think it was David Graeber said that, hmm. that capitalism is like a, a scaffolding around consciousness. Um, and I think the way in which desire is cultivated, you know, the way that, the way in which, whether it's consumer desire, whether it's desires of the ego, I think that there's a certain extension of that into, into the way that we think about technology. Um, I also, and I think, you know, I, I don't know, I guess I, I read a lot about indigenous models for thinking about technology and computing. And I have, you know, there's, there's, a, there's some really, really beautiful work about this, you know, like how you can, I think about this book called Beyond Nature and Culture, which is a kind of large analysis of all the different social ontologies you know, how, how it is that certain, like you said, sort of cultures that live in, in, in peripheries, that live in different, on different timelines, you know, that kind of live in, it's, it's, it's a different sort of world. Maybe it's the same planet, but a different world. How the social ontologies that are at the basis of, of a, if we want to say a control-oriented technological kind of solutionistic culture, like, is it possible to refactor some of these social ontologies or these, these, these desires, you know, like this to me, that's how I think about this, this question, you know, cause I feel like many of us are, are you know, we're, we're caught, we're caught up in a system of, of a growth of intelligence that's bigger than any of us. And I'm not, a, I'm not, a, I'm not a Luddite, you know, I don't think that, I don't think that technology is an inherently uh, bad or evil, you know, or, or, or anything like that. Um, but yeah, I think, I think that what maybe is most interesting to me is the way that the current maybe challenges we could say of planetary limits start to force new types of desire onto ch like changes in, in Away, I guess, away from control-oriented desires that people have um, towards different types of subjectivity. You know, it's really, it's really a lot to think about this relationship between very large-scale systems and and the role that each of us plays in the in the acceleration of certain systems or the the production of community. You know, and I think that's one of the nice things about world building. You know, as maybe a way of of coming to an end with this is that. It's really, as a process, it's agnostic to, to as, a, as a method, it's agnostic to all of these different competing projects, you know, that comprise the, the adversarialism 
of the world, you know, between centers and peripheries, between, you know, the global north and the global south, between, uh, you know, classes, like people, the world building is a kind of process that I think is uh, super, super effective, uh, very unifying for, for people that are working on any kind of project, I think. Um, whether it's a project of healing, you know, even a project of healing as a way of, of doing something like that. Um, so yeah, I don't know, those are my thoughts about that. Okay. Tendría este, muchas más preguntas, pero quizás tenemos que cerrar aquí. Nos extendimos mucho más de lo que debíamos. Y um, bueno, pues por mi parte, ya estoy. Muchísimas gracias, Piers. Gracias. Este, Arián. Sí, pues eh, sí, creo que es hora de, de cerrar. Eh, pero pues estuvo muy bueno eh, sí, conversar contigo y tu presentación. Uh, justo pues esperamos que sea, eh, sí, no definitiva, eh, sino provocativa. Uh, eh, y pues estimulante también, ¿no? O sea, creo que. Creo que, creo que puede cumplir como todas esas funciones. Esperaría, eh, sí, que ampliara eh, el diálogo eh, y el pensamiento eh, en el que, pues, quienes se han conectado eh, están eh, involucrados, involucradas, involucradas. Y, pues, aprovecho para agradecer a todas las personas que se conectaron. Eh, y, pues, de nuevo al CCD. Eh, y a quienes han estado trabajando para, para todo este ciclo de conferencias y pues muchas gracias Piers. Muchas gracias Piers. Estamos eh, hablando y espero podamos como seguir intercambiando ideas y, um, y reflexiones contigo. Bueno. Ok, gracias. Gobierno de México.